This is a much longer than usual lecture on a criterion for essay writing. It actually begins as more of a rant or a sermon at first. I don't know. I hope you'll stick it out with me. Here goes. How valuable is a truly excellent glass of wine? I'm not asking how much it might cost. I'm asking how valuable it is. Asked in North America in 2021, the question will likely prompt an array of reactions. Many will not be able conceptually to separate the question of the value of wine from the idea of money. Wine is as valuable as you can sell it for. A choice few will make comments that acknowledge the centuries of critical and aesthetic history in which enophiles have striven to analyze, critique, and describe the nuances of one grape, one barrel, one year or another in order to explore the richness and range of possibilities in winemaking and tasting both in the name of making wine ever better and more complex, and in the name of helping its drinkers truly live in their experience of it. Even as those appreciators may also perhaps rightly acknowledge how frustrating it is that elitist structures have withheld that rich wine drinking experience to only very few, and how that elitism has thus drastically limited the number of taste buds, and so the depth of taste to which winemakers and wine lovers have access. But most people, when asked how valuable is a truly excellent glass of wine, will say it's all elitist bullshit anyway. Frustrated by the continual institutional gatekeeping of wine and angered by the realization that the treasures behind that gate can only be appreciated with calm and engagement and reflection, slowly sniffing and turning and swishing, which none of us have time for anymore, they will disregard centuries of aesthetic and critical striving in one fell Philistine swoop and say, it's really all the same, it's really all just white or red, a rosé, and the rest is just one big scam. Let everyone drink whatever they like and shut up about it. If your wine sells well, then that's as good as good wine gets. And if it doesn't, and your heritage grape strain, your heritage grape strains die out, it sucks for you. Some sommelier is not going to tell me what wine is good and what isn't. Sure, the sommelier has spent their life working with depths of taste and pairings and such, but me, I just buy whatevs, and I know what I like, and beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and everything is relative anyway, and there's no such thing as taste, there's no such thing as anything, not beyond what I like or don't like. I'm assuming you've understood at this point that what is true of wine appreciation and how wine appreciation is received culturally is equally true of literary study. I think here of the word connoisseur, one who knows. To quote the OED, a person well acquainted with one of the fine arts and competent to pass a judgment in relation thereto, a critical judge of art or of matters of taste, as well as here of wines and delicacies, etc. You'll see it actually meant art first. To enter a university level program in English in theory, is to go from just loving language and literature to becoming a connoisseur of language and literature. To have spent enough time with language and literature, sniffing thoughtfully at language and literature, swishing language and literature around in your mouth, tracking language and literature to the barrels in which they aged and the fields from which their grapes grew, comparing sip to sip, bottle to bottle, and vintage to vintage in search of variety and in search of quality. So when you've completed your education, you appreciate language and literature so deeply you can see things in them no one else can. And you can help everyone else appreciate their beauty, their artistry, their power, and their meaning in ways that add beauty, artistry, power, and meaning to the world, even as the world might habitually doubt the power and meaning of what you do and of what language and literature can be. There is a strong parallel here, too, between close reading, really properly close reading, and the wine connoisseur's slow, thoughtful, and deeply informed sipping. And that is what university English professors are here to train you to do. The problem is that the way we generally do it is this. We invite you in because you love that wine, language and literature. I'm studying the metaphor here. By wine, I mean English literature and language. We invite you into our school for connoisseurs because you have loved that wine for much of your life. And then we say, you like that wine? Drink! 
Show me you love it! And we pour, and we pour gallons and gallons in your face constantly. Drink! Chug! Chug, 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 chug! We call on you to express your intimate knowledge of the 1983 French vintage as we pour a gallon of it down your throat while forcing you to chug four or five other gallons at once, constantly, and we just keep pouring and pouring, all the while saying appreciate, analyze, understand, pouring gallons of the stuff continually over your head, until you and your fellow would-be connoisseurs find yourself in a sea of wine, the cheap boxed stuff mixed with vintages centuries old, until nothing tastes like anything. The waves of wine rushing into your face and past your body at impossible speeds while you're just trying to breathe at all, let alone sniff any subtle bouquets. This is, of course, not what they do, I think, in sommelier, sommelier tree I can't say the word in sommelier training school. But what we do here feels equally absurd at times. We have turned into a massive, relentless boot camp the cultural discipline most necessarily founded on slow, reflective reading and discussion, on appreciation, and on thoughtful debate and argument. After three or four years of that, there are generally three reactions students can be expected to have. The first is that they learn to hate wine, to come out despising the love that drew them in. The second is to get so drunk and oxygen deprived from all of the flood, nearly drowning in the rush of the stuff, that they can barely taste wine anymore at all, or even be particularly aware of it when they're drinking it. And the third is to fake it, to become exactly the kind of faker about wine that the haters out there believe we all are anyway. My wife had a friend at university who worked at a, we went to university together, but it was her friend. She had a friend at university who worked at a fancy restaurant by night and was required by his employers to memorize in-depth descriptions of each vintage of wine they sold. But he was busy. He was working the job while going to school full time, as we all were. Luckily, this friend was very good at improv. So whenever customers asked him to describe the wine they were considering, he would just rattle off a perfectly coherent analysis that he had just made up. They were all very impressed with his knowledge of wine. His employers, who are also always so busy, never followed up to find him out, and may not have really cared. To the point, our over-assigning, over-rushed university culture is geared in the humanities toward producing English majors, minors, and specialists who become semi-conscious readers, haters of literature, or fakers, many of whom years later find they remember nearly nothing that they read or learned. Those students who come out differently, and there are many of you who do, those students who come out differently do so generally in spite of the way that the university is built, not because of it. I know many students who fight the current. I'd say most of my students that come to my classes, I find, fight the current. They fight to get something more out of what we offer here. But they have to swim hard against the current, and they can only escape so far. And to be clear, I believe that this is a university culture and university governance problem across most North American schools, not limited to my own. I find English departments, for the most part, very much including my own, do our best to ameliorate the wine flood problem. But there's only so much we can do, and only so hard we can swim against what is culturally systemically true of North American universities writ large. So let me talk about the students for instance, those semi-conscious readers, the ones who can barely breathe, breathe through all the wine. Let's talk about them first. The semi-conscious readers didn't enter the program necessarily as semi-conscious readers for the most part. School made them so for the most part. They were lovers of literature. I can't tell you how many students of mine seem unable by the time they come to me. I usually teach third year courses. By the time they come to me, unable to follow the most basic instructions I try to give them whether in person or especially in writing. I find these students are so continually panicking about staying afloat at all and so overwhelmed by the constant rush of it and so habituated to only ever rushing their reading that they look at an essay prompt or a course syllabus and they miss most of its details, even when I go over some of those details multiple times. These are students who are specifically here to learn to read in detail and to perceive nuanced meaning. So if I give a prompt, say, like this, right? This is a prompt I'm currently working with. 
Um, if I give a prompt like this, I inevitably and quite often get questions like, I know we have to focus on all 20 sonnets, but do we have to spend the same amount of time on each of them? You'll notice that it says, choose any one of the following texts, any of Shakespeare's first sonnets, right? Or they'll ask, do we have to look at secondary sources for this? The prompt says, in-depth reading and consideration of previous criticism. They'll ask, what are you looking for? Should I work in material from your lecture? The prompt says that the primary goal is to uh, convince me of something I did not believe before and to only include what is relevant to that primary focus. It is as though the student, given this prompt, sees instead this. Because the only mode of reading they know anymore at this point is rushed reading, is getting the rushed paraphrased gist of everything and plugging it just into a pre preconceived idea of what essays are, what assignments are to get it done. The cruel irony is that in most university English classes, reading that is this rushed, which is very, very common, ends up costing the student massively more time as they try to go over again and correct and recorrect everything, sending email after email to the professor to try to understand what was actually there if they had just slowed down and read it in the first place. This is not me ranting against the student. This is me pointing out the systemic failures that have led to this kind of reading in a discipline that is specifically geared toward training you to be a nuanced, patient, thoughtful reader. It's these students that have a lot of general trouble with essays. They generally have a lot of trouble with essays. And not only because returning continually to the prompt and understanding it is essential to doing well on an essay, but also because writing about literature is founded vitally in close, slow reading, which they demonstrate from the outset that they're clearly struggling with at this point. Students with certain disabilities, and often students whose first language is not English, are historically particularly susceptible to this. And they may even be led to believe by some of the crueler arms of university culture that rushed and, and incomplete reading is inherent to their disability or to their language skill level. It isn't. There's always a way to read deeply with whatever tools you have available to you. And if professors were doing our jobs better, let alone universities were doing our jobs better, we would work humanistically and individually with susceptible students to develop a substantial reading process and writing process that suits their particular needs and builds toward their particular strengths rather than shunting them off into protocols that end up doubling down on how much they have to rush. And then there are the students who get an A on every essay. Hey, A student, have you ever stopped at all to consider why you are able to churn out a writing assignment that's literally called an essay? That is an attempt, an endeavor, a first tentative effort in learning, a trial? That you can do that without really worrying too much about it, getting the same solid, untested grade every time? Has it occurred to you, A student, that you've cracked a formula of getting the grade at the expense of the slow process of learning, exploration, experimentation, reflection, trying, and even failing on which the essay is built? And has it occurred to you thus that your hacking that system, likely without even realizing you've hacked it, has robbed you of something? Have you asked yourself who benefits from rushing a student like you through the motions over and over again, doing the same assignment over and over again regardless of the class? Have you asked yourself who loses out in that equation? For you, I'd like to share a story from my own experience of university as an undergraduate. Uh, there's another guy that my wife knew at university. He was completely in love with his girlfriend. This was in our third year, and the guy and his girlfriend spent almost every moment they could together, truly, generally staying over at each other's dorms most nights. This was frustrating to the girlfriend's roommate, who was single and who had signed up with her best friend to room together the year prior, so that they could have proper single girl time. But the roommate suddenly found that she was either living alone, because her roommate was at the boyfriend's house, or that she had this dude also living with her in her space, more often because they had the nicer dorm. She hated this dude, and was generally and understandably very mean to him whenever he was there. One night she was trying to concentrate on writing an essay, and there was the dude, 
still in her room, trying not to be distracting, really trying, but being distracting just by being there. She was so rude to him so many times that night that the dude turned to her and said, Look, roommate, this has gone on a long time. I'm in love with your roommate, but I want to do right by you. Let me write the essay for you. I know you're supposed to be writing a comparison between the book version and film version of Cabaret. That's what you said you're writing on? Now, I've only seen the version on stage, so I'll need to ask you a couple questions just at the beginning. From there, give me three hours, and I'll get your essay done. The roommate said, naturally, you can't write an essay for a class you haven't taken on two things you haven't read or seen. And the dude said, oh, I can. But if I get you an A, you have to be nice to me from now on. He believed then that university essays were inherently hackable. And he had cracked the code. He sat down. He wrote for three hours or so, asking her a couple of questions, and then gave her the paper to look over. Then she submitted it with very few changes, and she got an A. She wasn't completely nice to him from then on anyway, but they did become good friends after that. He went on to marry the roommate, and the one who was mean to him before, the roommate who was mean to him before, he went on to marry the girlfriend, that is, and the girlfriend's roommate, who was mean to him, was in their bridal party. And later, when he became a professor of English literature at the University of Toronto, uh, I, he, uh, it was, it's me, Remained deeply in love with my university girlfriend. I ended up marrying her. Uh, the roommate of my university girlfriend, who's now my wife. Uh, the <laughs> English. Uh, my university girlfriend, who is now my wife. Her roommate ended up becoming good friends of ours. We're still good friends with her. Uh, and we visit. And our kids get along great together. So. Uh, the university essay. The university humanities essay. Remains hackable. I know that very well. But it shouldn't be. I'm actually, as a result, pretty good about spotting hack jobs when my students hand them to me. Most students who hack through university essays, robbing themselves of deep thinking, don't realize at all that they are doing it. And they find, as the wine gets poured and poured in their face, and this was me as an undergrad too, that they can imagine no other way to proceed. In my case, it was only because of the efforts the hard efforts of some excellent, excellent English and theater studies professors in both undergrad and grad school, that I learned that being able to quickly squeeze out an A paper isn't a reason to do so. But it took a lot of effort to break the habits I'd formed, because in a university culture that even then continually rushed me, I had fallen into a lot of bad routines. The professors who saw through those routines and still asked more of me, they made me who I am and I am forever grateful. The academic I've become now, the scholar I've become now, is one who is hyper-conscious of making his own research be painstakingly, thoroughly truthful. It takes me forever to do anything that I work on now. My book, my monograph, was 12 years in the making, and it still felt way too rushed to me. I still find things in it where I'm like, oh, I could have done that a little differently. Not because I'm worried that I'll get caught in a falsehood or a half-truth that I didn't notice, but because I'm terrified I won't get caught. And as an undergraduate instructor now, I am here with a particular understanding of what our wine-guzzling, rushed, hackable culture is, and of what the undergraduate humanities essay can do and can't do. That's why I teach the writing about literature course I teach. Essays in most English classes tend to work the same mental muscles over and over again, leaving students either baffled or hyper-specialized, often without actually measuring any skill, any skill set or knowledge specific to the class that assigns them. That's the reason why graduate student graders often never have to attend the class that they're grading papers for, which seems to me silly. It's the reason why certain skilled undergraduates find that they can get an A in a class that they have never attended. And that's the reason why fraudulent custom essay companies, you've seen these ads posted around campus, can haunt campuses, offering to write your essay for you for a fee. Usually the four is written as the number four, right? Uh, Dave Tomar, under the pseudonym Ed Dante, wrote about his experience being one of those hack essay writers, one of those people who haunt the campus, getting, uh, hire, getting hired to write students' essays for them and pretend it's theirs. Um, he wrote about his experience being a shadow scholar. I quote, he says, As for me, I'm planning to retire. I'm tired of helping you make your students look competent. It's a very intense article. 
um, I linked that article at the web in the web page in which this video was embedded below. Uh, you should take a look at it. It's disturbing. Now you'll note that I am not here including the usual pearl clushing horror at academic dishonesty. Don't do it! Don't you dare! Because how could I? I openly admit that I'm a former offender myself. I didn't write a falsified essay for a grade or for money. I wrote it because I was in love. <laughs> but still. Here I am rather pointing at how and why university culture pressures undergraduates into that most insincere writing in the first place. I do so because I believe there is only one way out, and that is to swim against the current of the flood of wine, even as it nearly overwhelms you, and to make a habit of demanding more from your essays and your reading assignments than has been asked of you. Let me pause for a minute here, if only because I'm a little concerned that semi-conscious listeners might think I am justifying or excusing plagiarism here. I offer you this diagram on process as an ethical spectrum for the undergraduate essay writer. That is, what I mean by that is what is wrong and what is right, like objectively wrong and objectively right, as well as what is good or bad for your growth as a thinker or writer, growth which, I would argue, will itself make the university more right and the world more right than it is. So, um... I want to sort of locate what I mean when I say hack jobs as opposed to rush jobs in this lecture and also put them in position to what essays really ought to be and what essays should never be, that is academic dishonesty. Um, so moving, moving from uh, left to right, let's start with academic dishonesty in the bottom left-hand corner. Academic honesty is always a bad investment. It's never, ever worth it, even if you don't get caught. And you really probably will get caught because English profs are very attuned to inconsistencies in style and content, and the punishment is rightly severe. Um, I am particularly good at catching academic honesty, dishonesty because, as I have explained earlier in this lecture, I am a former offender myself. But the worst of it is that you, in, that you invalidate by being academically dishonest, uh, you invalidate the legitimacy of the credentials for which you've worked. And that will haunt you your whole life in unexpected ways. If you are too academically dishonest, and honestly, if you hack too many jobs, you will find that 10, 20 years have passed and you look back on what your university striving was, what this diploma you got means, what this certification you got means, and it will ring hollow in a really sad way. That alone is punishment enough. What I mean when I say academic dishonesty, again remaining here in the bottom left-hand corner, is any time you present another person's work as though it is yours. It's plagiarism, or paying to have your essay written by one of those shadow scholars, by falsifying sources or presenting sources' ideas as, they, as though they are your own, etc. Even doing this by quote-unquote accident is negligence so blatant it might as well be intentional. Uh, and sometimes students sort of worry excessively about unintentional plagiarism, but the truth is just cite all your sources. And if you're worried about it and paying attention to it, you're probably fine. And if you need quite if you have questions about it, ask prof, right? Ask. And when in doubt, oversight. When in doubt, cite too much rather than too little. All right, then there's hack jobs. What I would say would be phoning it in, doing a hack job. What I mean by this, essays that are churned out quickly and with little or no care, love, or real complexity of thought, just by adhering semi-consciously, successful or unsuccessfully, to a formula that seems to work across all humanities classes, regardless of the material. No real regard for the material in any deep way. So this both covers the kind of hack job that I did for my girlfriend's roommate at university, and the kind of hack job, so the successful getting an A hack job, and also the either mediocre or unsuccessful hack job, the, the essays that are written without real attention to any element of the process, without real attention to thinking. Um, when shadow scholars, right, essay writers for hire, write those A-grade essays for classes that they've never taken on subjects they've barely read, they are doing hack jobs. They may get the A, but they're hacking it. Sometimes, though, we find we become our own shadow scholars without really realizing it, hacking through our assignments with no attention to how little thinking we're actually doing. And then we move into better waters. There's the rush jobs. 
what I mean by this as opposed to a hack job. And again, these terms are terms I'm using for ease of explanation just in this lecture, right? As opposed to a hack job, a rush job, right? Just a rush job in the sense I mean it here, is advised to engage with the material with a kind of depth, complexity, and sincere inquiry that a proper essay really should. It just does it in too little time so that the process is necessarily made somewhat shallower, somewhat more reductive, and somewhat more insincere than it should be. Rushing too much will do damage over time to how deep, complex, and sincere a thinker and writer you are and can be. But sometimes the truth is, rushing is simply unavoidable. And finally, on the right side, there's the true essay. What I mean by this is a slow, thoughtful, reflective, deep, complex, and sincere critical process. The work you do on an essay like that over weeks, weaving in your deep thoughts through discussion and lecture into a personal, individual, innovative, original, well-crafted, provocative argument, thesis. The work you do on an essay like that does good things to and for your brain, as well as for your lifelong intellectual practice. It is the height of what you are here at university to do. But oh, the present day university makes it hard for you to do it. So as we've said, present-day university culture tends to push you toward the left. That's the direction in which the wine flood current is pushing you, and thus the direction in which you have to paddle when you think about your process. The thing I call on you and challenge you to do is to paddle to the right. You've got to learn how and why essay writing skills are hackable and rushable, and how and why the requirements of essays are hackable and rushable. And I offer my 12 criteria on essay writing as one way to begin to do that. And then having mastered those repeatable fundamentals, you get to strive for better. For better and more substantial training in reading and thinking. Essay assignments usually only require to get an A, a set of relatively hackable skills. And our requirements at university should be pushing you further already. They should be pushing you to challenge and deepen your thinking and writing. But failing that, You've got to learn how to push yourself, right? Every essay does offer the opportunity to do so much more. It just doesn't necessarily require you to do so much more. And if you don't push yourself in that way, you will find after three or four years that you've missed the substance by grasping at the shadow. You can push yourself by attending to your process of writing about literature as much or more as you concern yourself with the finished product especially with the number or letter that gets assigned to it. Yes, I know the reasons that you feel you cannot do this. Yes, I know that they just keep pouring the wine in your face, pouring, pouring. But as things stand, it is the only way. I challenge you to strive to avoid rushing wherever you can. Perhaps by setting aside against all odds some space and time every week when you can stop, truly focus on, and enjoy and appreciate a glass of wine or two. At that moment, of those, in those terms, or forever when you are feeling flooded, at least choose some assigned readings each week and at least some essay assignments each term that you make sure to enjoy slowly, even if it comes at the expense of something else. But also, I challenge you to strive to avoid rushing whenever you can, but also to accept that rushing right now is inevitable. So you've got to learn to rush better. Learn to rush better. And no, I think I've said this already, but we professors can't just decide to stop pouring so much wine. I've tried. I continue to try. But we are increasingly prevented from changing our course by a variety of systemic factors on us that I will help happily rant about in office hours. This is not the time. For what it's worth, from our perspective, the truth is that the only way to enact systemic change at this point in the way that literature is studied at the university level would be for a critical mass of undergraduate students to start asking more of their humanities education than is asked of them, to start demanding that they come out of the process connoisseurs not just having rushed through the readings and rushed through the assignments, but connoisseurs of literature. In other words, the thing that you can do to improve your process as a writer and reader of university level literature is the same as what you can do to contribute to improving university humanities education as a whole, systemically. So that's lucky, if you're willing. 
what I can give you is this. Let's talk about process as a criterion that any undergraduate writer working on an essay about literature should keep in mind. This lecture is a very extended version of what is already included in my one-page handout on process, also copied at my webpage on process, where this video is embedded and where you may be watching this. You can feel free to follow along with those as I talk. So if you've received feedback from professors saying things like hasty, rushed, misunderstood prompt or assignment, you didn't follow my previous comments, or anything with which the professor seems frustrated or impatient, this is a criterion that likely requires your attention. When English professors have the rare opportunity to provide critical writing feedback directly to a student, the student's response tends most often to be something like, well, that's what I meant to do, but I ran out of time. For a literature student to develop an effective writing process, again, note that process is not product, that I am not concerned here with getting you a good grade as much as improving your craft and your ability as a thinker and a writer about literature. That student must think critically about and resist university culture's dominant understandings of time and feedback. Let's talk about feedback first. If you don't generally read your instructor's feedback very closely, the comments that we give you on your essays, you probably think it's because you just don't have time or you're so exhausted. It's more likely a matter of ego or insecurity. Most of my students, when they really ask themselves why they don't read their professor's comments, eventually get there. But the mature ability to receive and apply critical feedback on your work without taking the criticism personally is one of the most valuable lessons and marketable skills that a university humanities education can give. Don't squander it. Figure out what's really bugging you about the critical feedback, articulate it in writing to yourself, and think through ways to grow with it. Not just past it, but with it. And seek out criticism. Eagerly. If your instructor is not criticizing your work or isn't criticizing it much, if your instructor gives you something like, I have no complaints, A, go to office hours and ask for criticism. Ask for more. And if you have the chance to write more than once in more than one term for the same instructor, or especially if the instructor gives you the opportunity to do a rewrite of the same paper, it is definitely on you to go through every comment on the prior paper one by one as you work on the next paper for that instructor. Make sure you have responded to and applied each correction. If you have been unable to apply one of the corrections, then you got to explain why, ideally in an email to which the assignment is attached, on a cover page, or in office hours. Even if you will never write for the same instructor again, though, you should still go through every comment. Always read the, the comments that your instructor has left on your essay. It's one of the most important things for process. Read them twice. English professors' approaches to writing vary widely, so the best possible education you can get as a writer must come from writing for each of us in turn. And honing your work through critical feedback from such diverse but eminently authoritative sources. Again, think of your essays from class to class as the building and shaping of an ongoing portfolio. Keep those comments in a file that you can return to later. Don't throw them away. Each time you put a new set of comments in the file, compare them to the comments you have received before. And if you do not understand any of your professor's comments, you have to follow up in office hours, or perhaps by email, even after the term has ended. Now this is the point where that semi-conscious student who's not really reading or listening because they're so overwhelmed says, ah, all my profs are saying that they want me to do different things. Like they'll come out of this lecture and still say, well, I mean, you're telling me something that somebody else told me different. Yes, yes, that is true. I'm going to say it again. English professors' approaches to writing vary widely. The best possible education you can get as a writer must come from writing for each of us in turn and honing your work through critical feedback from such diverse but eminently authoritative sources. English professors' approaches to writing vary widely. I'm saying it again. <laughs> English professors' approaches to writing vary widely. The best possible education you can get as a writer must come from writing for each of us in turn and honing your work through critical feedback from such diverse but eminently authoritative sources. I don't think any of the times I've repeated that I've pronounced the word authoritative correctly, but I've tried. Anyway, this is one of the most important things I can teach you. You should be braiding together all of the diverse commentary you get on essays across 
the essay writing experience at university. That's how the repeated stress of doing the same task over and over again becomes productive of better critical thinking over time. Speaking of which, let's talk about time. The students who say, well, yeah, if I had the time, I could write something worthwhile, overestimate the amount of time that professional scholars usually have to generate our work. There is never enough time. There will never be enough time. So, this human so the humanity scholars work at every level must be to figure out how to make a sincere and real con- I shouldn't say never. There is almost never enough time. And you have to fight for it if you want what feels like enough time. And it won't feel like enough time. Anyway. The humanity scholars work at every level from undergraduate to professor is to figure out how to make a sincere and real contribution to humanistic discourse in the limited span of time. Sometimes even immediately, say in, in class exercises or in a class discussion, and sometimes under great pressure. Incidentally, doing that is also the work of a responsible ethical member of 21st century society overall. So, some tips. How to not rush. Some ideas, do free write exercises. They are easy, fun, and painless. Do a free write as soon as you get the assignment once, right? As soon as you see the prompt, do a free write. And then do it again as soon as you have chosen your subject. That will just get some ideas percolating early. If you're not sure what a free write is, I'll explain quickly. A free write is uh, an exercise you can do. You set a timer for an amount of time, 10 minutes or 20 minutes might be a good start, or maybe, maybe, maybe 10 or 15. Uh, but no fewer than 10. And for 10 minutes, you cannot stop writing. You can do this longhand or by typing. You cannot delete, you cannot cross out, you cannot go back over everything. You just have to write the thoughts as they occur to you. It sort of will feel like free and direct discourse. You will end up writing things like, I don't know what to say, I don't know what to say, I hate this professor, I hate this whatever, but 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 right. And you, you work yourself too by continually writing and not stopping. You work yourself too, get your ideas percolating. Percolating. Another idea, set a fake deadline for yourself. If your tendency is to procrastinate, own that and compress your work toward a deadline that is at least three days from when it is actually due. Then when the real deadline comes, it'll allow you to give the paper at least one last look. More importantly, have someone else read it through before you submit it at that stage. If you are a procrastinator, as I am, I encourage you to read uh, the, uh, the reading from Suzanne Akbari from her uh, edited book on how we write, which is linked below. It's pretty powerful. Uh, and she talks about her process of writing. Another tip, read assignments from the start with engagement. That is, read the assigned readings that you get, always in an engaged way, making notes. And there's more uh, uh, tips for that in my stakes uh, page, on my stakes page, which you can look at. Uh, before any writing prompt is given, I recommend that you read deeply enough into assigned texts that you can already articulate complex ideas about them. So you've already thought about the text when you discuss them in class so that when time comes to start thinking about an essay, you're primed and you're ready and you've got your text marked up. And finally, office hours, office hours, office hours. Office hours are the hidden treasure of your time at university. The time you put in at your prof's office hours, as busy as you are, as overwhelmed as you are, especially when you're working on an essay, that time will always yield net positive results for your work overall. The time you put in will always prove worth your time in the end. Okay, so that's how to not rush. But you are gonna still end up rushing. So here's how not to rush when you rush. A few tips. One, don't get judgy. When you find yourself up against a deadline, welcome to the club. Don't let your haste trigger an inferiority complex. Oh God, I should have done this earlier, I'm so stupid. My uncle was right about me. I don't know, whatever. <laughs> I don't know where that came from, right? If you trigger that inferiority complex, you'll be much less able to use the time you do have. Know that you're in good company when you're rushing. We all have to do it. If you're eligible for or deserving of accommodations, ask for them and ask for them ahead of time to get you the time you need. But when you find yourself pressurized, don't get judgy about it. Two, don't play it safe. For work done in haste, a risky but messy paper will likely do better and will teach you more than a tepid, obvious paper. A lot of students feel like when they're working with limited time resources, they should just hew close to the coast, stay close to the coast, right? Not go out into waters. And when they do so, they end up with a, a, a tepid, obvious paper that doesn't do as well as if they had still made time to take risks during their rush. Three, don't write when you're compromised. A late paper often does better than an exhausted one. If it's a question between handing it in late or staying up all night to get it done technically on time, by the way, 
professors need to remember not to make our deadlines in the morning. That enforces a terrible relationship with sleep that students have. I try to not do so. We should also not make deadlines after weekends. Anyway, that's another rant. But anyway, um, you'll often find that a late, late paper often does better than an exhausted one, but you should take into account what the late policy in the class is, especially if your prof has a lenient lateness policy, which I always do. It's very often a better choice and gets you a higher grade if you take the small lateness policy and hand it in a little bit after time. Four, don't sacrifice your health because the costs, not only because the costs to your craft will outweigh the benefits. The more you do things to your body that are harmful, right, in trying to get the thing done on time, that is sacrificing too much sleep, sacrificing really any sleep. You should always be trying to gun for a good night's sleep, even when things are really hitting the fan. Um, any kind of substances, legal or illegal, that people use to try to get the essay done, right? Whether you are caffeinating yourself beyond belief or doing something worse than that, you will find that if you have those practices as part of your essay writing habit, they will uh, make it harder and harder for you to write an essay over time. And then the costs will outweigh the benefits. And finally, five, don't be shady. Don't hire a shadow scholar, my God. Unethical choices in essay writing often come at the last minute. The students who get caught in it, whether they're plagiarizing or hiring it out or whatever, uh, they end up revealing that they just were so panicked at the end they didn't know what else to do. Right? Those unethical choices in essay writing often come at the last minute. Many explode in the students' faces. The cost is way higher. And then all end up doing serious, and even if you don't get caught, it ends up doing serious permanent damage to the craft of your writing and thinking. So okay, we've done how to not rush. We've done how not to rush. Let's talk about how to rush. He said, ironically, in an extra long lecture. How to rush. We, we all do it because we all have to. So it's essential to know how to rush productively and fruitfully, to do your best in that rushing. Again, I refer you to Suzanne Akbari's excellent piece on her writing process and on productive procrastination, which again, you can find linked at the bottom of the page in which this video is embedded. And here are some of my own tips about how to rush well. Even when you're running late because a paper you care about will always flow more readily, you have to take the time to play in the sandbox a long time, right? So let's say you have X number of hours to get the essay done. You should do, I can't do math. You should do one third of that X time should be spent still in the sandbox figuring things out. Don't decide what your thesis statement is quick and then just hew to it because you think that that'll get the essay done quicker. It actually won't. When you find the stakes you care about, when you take the time to really read through the text and care about it, you will find the writing moves so much more quickly in the end, flows so much more out of you because you care about it. Take the time to play in the sandbox a long time, even when the pressure is on. It is an initial investment with great yield. So if you got, say, 10 hours to work, sorry about my math, you should probably spend the first three or four of those hours just kicking the text and the research around before you start hypothesizing. Uh, weird. On this list should be enlist help. Keep friends and family nearby for last minute proofing and feedback. When you're really rushing, there's nothing better than asking someone, hey, could you look over this for me? Even if it's someone who hasn't taken the class or doesn't specialize in what you're studying. Crave criticism, relish, in mistakes. When you're pressed for time is when your worst writing habits and your worst misunderstandings about writing come out most clearly. This is sort of bringing it back to the feedback thing. So if you see your rushing as an opportunity to learn more about yourself as a writer, how do I write when the pressure's really on? Not only will you get more out of the feedback because you won't be saying, well, I would have done that, but I had no time, but also you'll be less likely to freeze up when you write because you'll be thinking of it as a valuable process, of writing as, uh, as rushing as a valuable process, which will make you more likely to succeed anyway. And finally, as we've already said a few times, be sure to read everything with engagement, whether it's the prompt for the assignment, the syllabus, or the reading uh, readings you're assigned. Read it all with engagement and care to the degree you can as much as you can. Return to them again and again during your thinking and writing, especially when you're rushing. You should be looking back at that prompt frequently looking back at the source text and your major secondary source text frequently. Take care even when you're rushing, especially when you're rushing, to understand the conceptual frame of what you're doing. But okay, that's not enough. Let me finally, as penance for my past sins, put some proverbial money where my mouth is on this one, on how to rush well. So, a week or so before I put this process lecture together, I decided to try an experiment to see if I could do again now what I did for my university girlfriend's roommate, or now my wife's former roommate. 
But this time, I wanted to try to do it as ethically and responsibly as possible. What I did in university was a hack job, but now I wanted to try to rush, but not hack it or fake it. I asked my current students to generate an essay prompt for me on any subject they wished, so that I should, uh, instructing me to create a 1500 word paper and post that, and I asked them to prompt that, po <laughs> I asked them to post their invented prompt by noon the day after I asked. And I promised not to sign on, this is on Discord, until noon, so that I would have to enter that essay truly cold, the way I did for my girlfriend's roommate way back when. So I would try to do a rush job. I feel like I kept jumping around that story. I married the current girlfriend. I didn't marry her roommate. <laughs> I wrote the essay for the roommate. She started liking me. That allowed me to continue to date the girlfriend, her roommate. And then we got married years later and we all stayed friends. Sorry, I just want to make sure that that's clear. Um, anyway, uh, so I tried this time to do an ethical rush job. This is the experiment I'm now doing. One that isn't the best choice for my learning and thinking, but one that still retains some value and helped me learn and think and thus produce a better essay as a result. My hope with this experiment was to get it done all that day, but my childcare duties stepped in at hour seven, and the prompt they gave me was really more of a, a 10 hour minimum job. So I was still able to produce a roughly 1500 word essay for them in 10 hours, though in uh, two, two, uh, two goes, <laughs> um, in 10 hours from scratch on a subject I knew nothing about previously, which I had no prep for, one which I, an essay which I think would score a solid A in an undergraduate class, I think. I posted a link to the essay I created in those 10 hours, and I welcome your critical feedback to see what you think of it, if you wish to look at it. I don't think I could have responded to the prompt they gave me in less time than 10 hours, not without compromising too much. For one thing, the prompt was asking me about ethical political questions, which I definitely should not rush any faster than I already did. In my own class syllabi, I factor in, right, so when I design a class syllabus, I factor in about 18 to 20 total work hours for an essay of the size that was given to me, which I spread across five weeks, uh, often including reading week and or finals week in that time. And then I reduce my assigned weekly reading times accordingly during those five weeks. I assume my classes should use about eight hours total of my students' time per week. If you're taking five classes, that's eight times five. That's a 40-hour work week. Yes, I do that math when I pick up my assignments. So that 18 to 20 hours that I allow for an essay of this size does not include the initial reading and discussion of each text, which we already do across class lectures and discussions. So that's in, that's, that's in contrast, right? So the, the norm should be 18 to 20 hours for a 1500 word paper, I would think, uh, not including the ongoing prep that is constituted by the class discussions and lectures. The 10 hour rush job I did in the experiment, in contrast, was truly from scratch. In this experiment, my own expertise gave me no advantage. The prompt they gave me, the students gave me, was on a subject I had never studied at all at the university level. So I was at a disadvantage. I never, they gave me James Joyce, a, a story by Joyce that I had never read. I've never studied James Joyce in a university classroom ever. So all I had to work with here were my 12 criteria for good writing about literature, which I know really well, especially including my sense of process. If I had given it more time, it would have been better far, far, far better, especially for me, to have thought through the short story my students assigned me, they assigned me James Joyce's Araby, to have thought through it at length, to have listened to a prof's, like uh, an expert's lectures about it, and engaged with that expert in discussion actively, after having read it thoughtfully weeks before, allowed its ideas to germinate, talked it over in office hours, in addition to a proper 18-hour development process. That's the way an essay should be done, and that's the way that serves best to build your ability as a connoisseur. And you do have to push for that whenever you can. But the truth is that sometimes you can't. In the wine flood of university humanities studies, we sometimes make slow reflective study and argumentation impossible for our students. It's a systemic problem, and it's one that isn't going anywhere for a long time. So in the reality, sometimes you only have a day, for whatever reason, or only a night. Though I want to warn you against too many all-nighters. You only have so many of those in you before they start doing permanent damage. Trust me. In short, you've got to rush better and learn to rush better. Importantly, let me address what my rush job, which I think was a good rush job, robbed me of still. I must admit that I enjoyed the Joyce short story Araby more when I read it the first time, and this was my first time reading it at the beginning, than I did after. Doing this rush job made me less able to love the story. It started to feel, and still kind of feels, like a target to hit rather than a bath to luxuriate in. I feel I've mixed my metaphors there. Had I taken my time, I would have found an approach that was truer to my heart 
in reading the story. But the argument I came up with is fine, though, I think. And I learned much, and, and, and it is a, a fair, I think, and rigorous argument. And I learned much and retain much, especially from the three secondary sources on which I spent the most time. That would be the Ehrlich, the Kana, and the Schloss. But also, going through the process put me in a mindset for a day, more than a day afterward, in which thoughtful, reflective reading was impossible. I sat down that night after my editing and I tried to, before bed, read from a book of poetry that I had been given, been given as a gift. Yes, I sometimes read poetry before bed. You should too. But when I tried, I could not feel or focus on the poetry. I was already so, right? I tried to play with my older daughter earlier that evening, but I couldn't stay in the game and playing with her. I even looked at my phone while she was talking to me. My attention was fundamentally diffused. To do this kind of rushed compression of critical thinking regularly and habitually does something to you. If you do it too often, even if you're doing it well and responsibly, you begin to start to associate adrenaline with reading and critical thinking. I still do sometimes. The bad work habits I developed in undergrad and high school still haunt me. So take care, and forced as you are to rush sometimes, choose your poison with caution. With all that said, the experiment I did, which you can see again, below in a video that you can watch if you want, provides an example offered in good faith of how you might rush. Rush but not hack. Rush but not hack. Rush better. While still saying, staying sincere and still getting something substantial out of the process. Pay attention to how much time I spend at each stage. I put that sample in the lecture video below, embedded in the same page in which the, this video is embedded. You can also find their links to the essay draft as it stood at the seven hour mark and then the finished 10 hour project. Product. Product. I had meant also to post the nine hour version. I say as much in the video, but it turns out in my rushing, I of course saved over it. So I hope these things are useful to you. Uh, by the way, it's always a good idea, even when rushing, to email yourself your current messy draft and all your notes every few hours, something I often forget to do and often wish I hadn't forgotten. So thanks.